Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I will now call the Torrance City Council Finance and Governmental Operations Committee uh, meeting to order on Tuesday, December 7th, 2021 at 3 o'clock p.m. Staff, may I please have a roll call? Good afternoon, Chair Ashcraft. Chair Ashcraft? Here. Councilman Chen? Present. Councilman Griffiths? Here. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to uh, have everyone join us in a flag salute led by C committee member Griffiths. Please face the flag and join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would like to welcome those of you who are joining us this afternoon and thank you for your participation. Pursuant to Assembly Bill 361, Governor Newsom's proclamation of a state of emergency on March 4th, 2020, and the order of the Health Officer of the County of Los Angeles, Department of Health, revised September 28th, 2021, the City Council and staff may participate in this meeting in person or via teleconference or other electronic means. The council chamber is closed to the public in the interest of maintaining appropriate social distancing and in order to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19. We appreciate your patience during this unprecedented time. For today's meeting, we are using Zoom webinar platform. Members of the public will be participating as attendees. Everyone will be muted until the public comment period at which time you will have the opportunity to be heard by calling 310-618-2404. At this time, I would like to introduce myself and ask my colleagues to introduce themselves as well. I'm Heidi Ashcraft, committee member and also councilwoman. Mike Griffiths, committee member and councilman, District 6. George Chen, councilman and Councilman District 2 and committee member. Thank you. At this time, I would like to ask staff members to participating in today's meeting to introduce themselves. Please, Mr. Shaparian, you want to start? Good afternoon, Chair. Adam Shaparian, City Manager, to my left. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee Members. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee Members. Chris Oshie, Interim Deputy Treasurer with the Finance Department. Good afternoon, Sheila Poisson, Finance Director. Good afternoon, Ian Daly, Assistant Finance Director. Dana Pajardo. Cortez, City Treasurer. Oh, sorry. Dana Pajardo, Management Assistant with the Finance Department. And I'm Katie Wan with the City Manager's Office. And I'm sorry, Dana, are you on the line as well? Yes, Ms. I am. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we'll go into... At this time, we will now go into our oral communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comment on items on the agenda or on topics of general interest to the public that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Finance and Governmental Operations Committee. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the Finance and Governmental Operations Committee cannot act on items that are raised during public comment but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. Re or we can request clarification. Or refer the item to staff. Each member of the public will get three minutes to speak. Do any of the members of the public wish to be heard? Thank you, Chair. There are no calls uh, on queue right now. I'm sorry, call center. Are there no callers on the line at this time? Um, hello, this is uh, Zoma. There are no calls on queue right now. Thank you.
Good afternoon. We haven't received any callers at this moment. Thank you for holding. We don't have a definite time, so we can go forward. Thank you. At this time, I will turn uh, the meeting over to staff to present today's items. Katie, if you can move forward to the agenda, please. Hello? Good afternoon, Chair Ashcraft and Council Members Chen and Griffiths. This is Sheila Prasad, Finance Director, here to present results from this fiscal year 2022 first quarter recommendations and program modifications from several departments. Uh, this will be followed by Interim Deputy City Treasurer uh, to present our investment portfolio uh, summary and results, and we'll conclude with closing remarks from the City Manager and questions from committee members. Next slide. Uh, before getting into the first quarter results, I wanted to give a brief recap of our financial history and current financial state. Uh, as you know, City Council in October authorized staff to move forward with its educational outreach efforts regarding finances, and since then we've found this to be a common area of question. Although COVID-19, the pandemic did deplete essentially all of our reserves in fiscal 20 down to $600,000. In the five years preceding the pandemic, general fund expenditure growth was already outpacing the revenue growth and the city relied on its fund balance to cover. Uh, so we started with 29 million in fiscal year 15 down to 600K in fiscal 21 and we're projected to be back up to 24 million by the end of this fiscal year as we slowly rebuild that. Next slide. More specifically, this shows the growth in each fiscal year. As, and as you can see, on average, the expenses outpacing revenues by about 1.2%. Next slide. Uh, so here's another chart to visually show the trend. And as you can see, the gap between the two lines, revenues and expenses growing in the latter years, which we are currently now trying to manage. Next slide. As a full service city, our largest expense, of course, is salary. And as you can see from this slide, we've been reducing staff levels since the recession in 2009, uh, starting at the peak of roughly 1,200 employees in the general fund, down to about 1,000 in the current year. Next slide. Um, looking at general fund staffing levels by department, um, here you can see that these reductions have impacted every department and overall that the city's reduced staffing by about 10% uh, since that last recession, recession in 2009 over the 10 years, and more if, the re if reductions are uh, ultimately applied to public safety in July 2022. Next slide. Uh, since the pandemic, we've implemented $15.7 million in reduction, that's both in salaries and materials. Um, that's in fiscal 21 to respond to the pandemic and uh, the current trends, and another 6.3 in this current fiscal year, um, with uh, an additional 8.2 in police and fire that's been deferred to July 2022. Next slide. This slide is really just a recap um, of those uh, mitigations I'd mentioned in the previous slide to show that um, we have implemented reductions in both the expenditure and revenue side. And um, since the last two years, totaling about $22 million, recurring, ongoing. Next slide. Okay, now um, moving into this, uh, this year's first quarter. As a first quarter, expenses, as always, they typically exceed revenues for the first three months, mainly because of timing. Uh, for example, property taxes and business license taxes have not yet come in within these months, and yet we've already made the payment on our lease revenue bond. Um, that's why it's, it's important to also look at the very right-hand column, that's the, the projected total for year-end. And as of today, we project that revenues will exceed expenses by $11 million, keeping in mind that this is citywide, so that includes all the enterprise funds, which are transit, water, sewer, and sanitation. Next slide. Um, this is uh, kind of a, a breakdown of what that previous slide where we, sh we show 11.4 million citywide. That 11.4 consists of these funds. So in the general fund, there's operating and restricted. The operating fund is expected to uh, operate at the end of this year with a $314,000 surplus. The restricted slash assigned fund 
is expected to operate at a 2.7 million surplus. The bulk of that really being um, a contribution of 1.8 million to the, our section 115 pension trust. Um, our self insurance fund is anticipated to experience a $5.6 million loss despite a significant contribution, one time contribution this year of 15.8 million. Fleet services is expected to break even. Um, however, this fund also has, it consists of two sub funds, operating and replacement, and the operating fund is, ex is expected to uh, uh, operate at a structural deficit. Um, so mainly that 11.4 million consists mainly of um, surpluses in the enterprise fund led by uh, water and transit, uh, noting that in transit, seven and a half million of the revenues are one-time grants. Next slide. Um, here's a, kind of another visual of what makes up the 11.4. As you can see here, those that are boxed in red are the funds that we're monitoring um, who are expected to operate at losses going forward, if you don't count one-time sources. Next slide. Um, going forward uh, over the next several slides, we'll be focusing on the general fund operating fund. This is where most of our city activities are housed. Um, and here again, we, we see that we're expected to operate at a sur uh, $313,000 surplus, um, and that's including the one-time rescue uh, plan act funds of $12 million. Next slide. Uh, talking about our revenues, as always, we uh, look at our top three, rev our core revenues, that's sales tax, property tax, and utility users, with our, our largest general fund source being sales tax from point of sale transactions and online transactions from the county pool, um, property tax, which is based on our uh, taxable assessed values. Uh, this has increased 3.2% from the prior year, and um, per usual, we uh, torrent is is still in the top 10 highest valued cities in LA County. And um, third, a utility users tax, which is a six and a half percent tax applied on utilities such as electricity, gas, and water. Next slide. Um, comparing last year's quarter, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, this year's quarter, September versus last year's, we are in both sales tax and utility users tax exceeding last year's results. Property tax, at least at this point, is, is holding steady, but anticipated at year end to exceed the 12 month results. Next slide. Um, in sales tax, as I'd mentioned, we are tracking above prior year by 1.7 million. The largest factor uh, being new car sales. In new car sales, particularly, that increase is showing uh, 1.1 million in Q2 alone. Um, really driven by a buying frenzy and, and, and also um, a new auto brand that's now reporting their results in the city. Um, we do uh, maintain uh, really cautious about uh, the car sales and our um, forecast given that, given the recent news on the global chip shortages and, and supply issues. Um, the next largest increases were in general consumer goods, restaurants and hotels and fuel service stations. Um, I'd also like to note that um, although these are the largest increases if we're comparing 21 to 20, um, mainly because these groups were also those that experienced the largest declines in 2020. Next slide. You can see here um, that the general consumer goods, restaurants, hotels, fuels and services, and autos um, are outpacing growth. Um, Chair Ashcraft had a good question um, regarding sales tax. In um, all, um, she had asked whether, um, how are we comparing to pre-pandemic levels? We did take a look, let me see if I can pull that up right here. Um, at pre-pandemic levels, and it's looking like um, for this particular quarter, we are exceeding a pre-pandemic in auto building food and drugs, and obviously the state and county pool, um, but we're still lagging in the business and industry area, fuel and service, and restaurants and hotels. Next slide. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, I guess to conclude a little bit here on sales tax, 
we do continue to be cautious with forecasting. We are seeing, um, you, you may hear people saying it's a red hot market, there's been pent up demand. We definitely see that, it's positive to news for Torrance. However, with um, inflation being experienced these days and um, whether or not um, consumers will start to, to pull back um, is, is unknown at this time. Um, auto dealers uh, have mentioned that they expect inventory levels to return um, it at the end of calendar fiscal 22, if not early 23. Next slide. Um, I wanted to kind of show the history of our sales tax here, particularly in Torrance. Um, uh, there have been significant increases in sales tax the two years following the remodel of the Delamo Fashion Center. Um, the addition of the lifestyle wing drove up foot traffic. Um, so you can see there the jump from a 34 million up to 51 once that remodel uh, was completed. And after that, we can see it actually being able to drop off and then fluctuate up and down before the pandemic, partially due to the Supreme Court uh, Wayfair ruling, which required out-of-state online retailers to report sales into California. So really just to see here that uh, consumer confidence and, and habits, um, pre-pandemic even, we'll see how it goes after, but they do fluctuate with the economy and are sensitive. Next slide. Property tax, our second largest revenue. Um, here's where we can really see that Torrance truly is a balanced city with um, the assessed values being 66% in residential, 17% uh, in commercial, and 9% in industrial. Pretty healthy mix. Um, we, see, we have seen that prices continue to rise in response to low inventory and low interest rates. Uh, for example, the median sale price of a detached single family residential home in Torrance as of Q3, calendar Q3 21, was $1.1 million, which w is 172,000 more uh, than the median sale price in the same quarter last year. Next slide. Um, receipts, as I mentioned earlier, are consistent with last year. Uh, currently, we expect to exceed budget by 2.3 million, both due to increased assessed value and also the volume uh, volume of sales in FY20. Next slide. Uh, third largest revenue source for the city is utility users tax. So currently we're tracking above the prior year by 641,000 and uh, we continue to expect to exceed budget uh, by 1.1 million, uh, mainly driven by uh, the increase in electricity and gas rates. The California electricity rates are amongst the highest in the country. Um, as the state starts and begins to work towards its new power system to meet the climate crisis, thereby um, driving that cost to the, the ratepayers. Cellular and telecom receipts continue to decline um, as uh, data begins to be the majority of use. Uh, next slide. Other revenues to kind of round out our top five are occupancy tax and business license. Um, business license tax are expected to begin uh, coming in in January. We just sent out the, the renewals, uh, I want to say three days ago, um, and we're expected to meet that budget. Occupancy tax increased 1.4 million compared to last year. Uh, last year. Um, not surprisingly, as we start to slowly open back up, um, the occupancy rate percentage increased 51% in January through September 2020 to 68% in 21. Uh, however, we are still under pre-pandemic levels of about 80 plus percent occupancy rate. The average daily rate per room also increased by about $5. Um, so if we continue this trend through the end of the year, we anticipate a budget surplus of one and a half million, though still ending below pre-pandemic levels. Next slide. Somewhat new this year that we'll be covering now in during first quarter is charges for services. Uh, since we've consolidated the Cultural Arts Center, Emergency Medical Services, Parks and Rec, and Animal Control Funds into the general fund, and we see um, that charges for services, of course, with, with um, the economy opening back up, increased 2.6 million from last year. Um, that 2.6 mainly composed of 
fire, uh, FIRE's new EMS program, which is expected to exceed budget by about 485,000. Um, in Parks and Rec, they're projected to exceed budget as the program's return by 600K. And in both community development and general services, where they're expected to proceed, um, exceed budget by 400K. Um, as we see, as you can see out in the street, development continues to be strong. Next slide. So to, to really summarize um, our recommendation of increasing the revenues, general fund revenues by 7.6 million, um, the, over the slides I had just uh, finished covering um, with the increases in those specific taxes, net, um, net shortages in franchise tax, construction tax, use of money and property, and property transfer, operating transfers in, um, that's how we net that 7.6. So the recommendation this afternoon would be to increase it just for this fiscal year um, uh, to offset, uh, as I'll uh, cover in forthcoming slides, um, deficits in expenditures. Next slide. On the expenditure side, uh, general fund operating expended 28% of uh, the budget. That's an increase of 11.3 million from the prior year. Um, this is also attributable though to the consolidation of the previous enterprise funds I had mentioned earlier. So those expenses are now being um, included in the general fund and the timing of the new lease revenue bond, which was paid um, in that first quarter. So we should see, um, at least we expect to see in first quarter next year is that uh, the year over year change should be somewhat um, consistent. Next slide. As we look at expenses by department, or at least where we forecast it to be, um, it's anticipated that every department will expend within or under their budgeted levels through our efforts of holding vacancies. Um, with the exception of city clerk, that's only because of election costs, because I think it's about 200K in election costs. Um, if we don't include the election costs, they are expected to be within their budget. Um, and then uh, the biggest real, um, I should say overage in expenses is in non-departmental. Um, non-departmental includes, as I'd mentioned, a 15.8 million contribution to self-insurance given the current uh, litigation trend. Next slide. Um, kind of pulling out police and fire, uh, just to reiterate that um, formal action was deferred uh, of $8.2 million to next July. Um, for this year, it's anticipated that both departments will uh, yield savings in police of 920,000 and in fire 1.3 million, both from vacancies um, and strike team reimbursements from fire. Next slide. Overall, um, the city expects a 7.5 million overage in expenditures. Uh, as a result of this 15.8 million. Uh, without the 15.8 million contribution to self-insurance, the city would be saving about 8.3. Uh, the recommendation this afternoon uh, would be to increase um, the overtime, I'm sorry, yes, the overtime budget to correct um, past practices by 6.75 million and an additional transfer to self-insurance. Next slide. Over the next several slides, I'll be covering um, multiple areas of concern that staff are tracking closely. These areas will require attention in the near term and over the coming budget cycle. That's overtime, self-insurance, fleet services, our cash balances, and, and labor tracking. Next slide. Um, in overtime, um, historically, the city has under-budgeted these costs and They've been, we've been able to manage through um, vacancies that are typically floated throughout the year in any given year. Um, so the recommendation this afternoon would be to increase the general fund operating funds overtime budget to cover these costs and really true it up to where actuals typically land. That's at about 6.75 million. Of that 6.75, 3.9 will be allocated to police, 2.1 in fire, and 0 0.7 to the other departments, non-state police. Next slide. 
Um, this next uh, area of concern is self-insurance. The cash balance at June 30, 2021 was 12 million. However, it does have a negative $55 million fund balance and is projected to operate at a $21 million deficit. That's uh, summarized in the table below. Um, really due to an upward trend in workers' compensation costs and litigation, uh, particularly in civil rights, catastrophic injury, and wrongful death matters. Um, this is based on actual open claims and cases. Um, average annual cost is approximately $8 million, and we've already spent $8.3 million in the first three months, which is 72% of the, the entire year's budget. Next slide. Um, the fleet services, as I'd mentioned earlier, the fleet um, consists of two sub funds, operating and replacement. Um, in replacement fund, there is a need to true up that fund balance to where we um, anticipate the replacement cost will be in the future. Um, we, uh, staff projects the balance in this fund to be 3.5 million lower or short, I should say, um, of funding to replace the accrued uh, current amount of vehicles, and in the enterprise, about $9 million lower. Um, in, uh, in fleet, that would mean a 690000 additional annual recurring cost to keep on track with what that balance should be, and in the enterprise funds, another 735000 to keep on track. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, Still talking about fleet here, the operations fund, the cash balance at June 30th was a negative 5.2 million, and that uh, and the operations fund alone has a negative fund balance of 4.6. Um, looking forward, it has a structural deficit of about one to two million annually. Uh, currently, we are working with uh, the general services fleet department to come up with a model to address this deficit, and we'll be returning um, either at mid-year or during the budget cycle to, uh, to address that. Next slide. <clears throat> Another area of concern we're looking at are our low cash balances. Um, there is a reason that the California State Auditor uh, gave uh, Torrance zero points in the category of liquidity. Um, as you can see here, um, we do, uh, this is at the end of June 30th. So with a total cash and portfolio balance of $161 million, only $11.6 million at that time was uh, allocated to general fund. Um, the other areas that the cash sits in is enterprise fund, non-major governmental funds that makes up $45 million. That's Measure R, Measure M, Prop A, C, gas tax, um, internal service funds, capital improvement, fiduciary funds, which technically are not city city funds. We are the fiduciary. and. Um, our other post-employment benefit funds. Um, with general fund expenditure accounting for 61% of the budget, but only 7.2% of the cash total, that's a concern. Next slide. Um, another trend we're monitoring and we're also facing this challenge is what you may have heard of the great resignation. We are currently in the tightest labor market of modern times. Um, the pandemic has really allowed employees to reevaluate their lifestyles and their priorities. In many instances, employees are leaving their current roles for better opportunities or, or driving others um, to retirement. Um, as of November 2021, 265 employees are eligible for retirement. That's purely based on a, an, a range, an, an age of 55 years. And then, um, I guess I'll, I'll go over to the next slide, please. As you can see here, there has been a spike in this, this quarter alone um, in resignations for other positions. Next slide. Looking at the numbers and the trend, um, we see that I mean, the silver, I, I guess it used to be called the silver tsunami. This was before it was called the great resignation, but silver tsunami referring to a level of retirement. Um, in terms of retirement, the city is seeing kind of the same trend in, in that level. However, if we're looking at voluntary resignations, in the first three months alone, we've seen um, 31 uh, departures, um, whereas in the previous two years, we've seen four, around below 40 for 12 months. 
Um, the most common cited reasons for recent departures have been better salaries and benefits and uh, flexibility. So um, we are, staff are trying to um, address this challenge and, and be as flexible as we can, but as we know, there's uh, certain constraints. Next slide. Um, we've been monitoring our fund balance over the last several years. Um, I don't think anyone will ever forget this $581,000 figure. Um, fortunately, uh, through our efforts of holding vacancies, um, budget reduction, and one-time revenue, such as ARPA, we've been able to build that back up to $24 million. Um, although the GFOA does recommend a minimum of 20% or two and a half months of unassigned balance, which is about $43.2 million. So at the bare minimum, we're trying to reach that. Next slide. Um, quick CalPERS update. As of June 30th, 2021, the CalPERS portfolio earned 21.3% return. Um, this triggered their funding risk mitigation policy, which basically states that if the actual return exceeds the current discount rate, which was 7% at the time, by 13 points, um, it, it triggers the discount rate to be lowered to 6.8, and that's where a cal CalPERS ultimately decided to land. They could have went lower, but they decided to stay at 6.8. Based on this discount rate, it's projected that normal costs will increase about a million dollars annually, um, but the unfunded actuarial liability decreases about six to seven million dollars. That's beginning fiscal year uh, 24, because it's typically operates, the changes are in a two-year lag. We are cautious, though, about the likelihood of reaching these returns, um, given that the latest capital market assumptions by CalPERS um, has a projected 10-year return of 5.3 and a 20-year return of 6.2%. And that's, uh, the 6.2 is what we use for our forecast. Next slide. Uh, bear with me on this one. I know there's a lot of colored lines, but um, really the purpose of this chart is to show the sensitivity and volatility of the impact um, what the impact is on our employer contribution based on investment returns. So we'll start with that black line. That black line is where we were at before knowing CalPERS were, was going to um, experience a 21% return. So that's based on a 7% return, 7% discount rate. Um, now that we know that there was a 21% return in the other colored lines, um, what, uh, just to show what our um, employer contribution is um, based on different um, investment returns. So the yellow one represents our current discount rate, but with an investment return of 6.8. Uh, so you can see that uh, dipping, dipping down starting in 26, 27 and continuing to decrease. The red line shows, hey, what if we you know, still have that 6.8 discount rate but we only experience an investment return of 5.3. So you see that red line jump up. And the green line um, is, is kind of the middle of the road, and, and that's where CalPERS expected their 21-year return to be. Um, so that green line is what we had included in our 10-year uh, assumption. Next slide. Our 10-year forecast updated for this year's um, Based on uh, this current quarter's results, improvements in revenue, changes in unfunded actuarial liability payments um, is below. And as you can see, uh, given um, if we are uh, fortunate enough to address the issues that were um, presented in the previous slides, we're still seeing a structural deficit um, before uh, projected police and fire reductions. If police and fire reductions are implemented, um, it allows additional reserve contributions, which we know we need, um, and that ends, um, you know, it allows us to break even at the end. Next slide. Um, just quickly moving through kind of w what is the economy looking like? Um, looking at uh, gross domestic product, this reflects the value of goods and services produced by the economy in a year. Um, we're experiencing a supply chain crunch uh, that's anticipated to last until the end of calendar 2022. 
and inflation continues to be on the rise. Uh, we see it ourselves in gas prices and even Social Security, who hasn't seen an increase in ages, uh, granted a 5.9% COLA increase. Next slide. In the labor market, uh, as of September, unemployment was at 4.8. The U.S., in the U.S., California, though, was higher than that at 7.5, and L.A. County even higher at 9.8%. Um, since the peak, 17.4 million jobs were added back. Um, uh, employment is a, a lagging indicator, though. Um, next slide. Um, this kind of shows how we compare to L.A. County and some of our other neighbors um, and uh, would like to note that um, while the, the trends are looking good for Torrance, and as um, usual, we continue to be a, a lower in unemployment than some of our other neighbors and comparables. Next slide. Um, consumer spending. Uh, we also monitor uh, confidence levels as well as demand is a critical engine of not just the U.S., but especially here in Torrance, as we rely mainly on uh, sales tax revenues. and. Uh, Confidence has really been extremely volatile since the pandemic, which is anticipated with all the uncertainties. Next slide. Um, as you can see here, it's dipped where we expected to dip in the second quarter of when the pandemic first hit, but has seen a gradual increase since. So consumer confidence returned to 100.34 uh, uh, as of um, Q2, which is the highest level since the pandemic but in Q3 dropped back down to 99.6, likely uh, with news of supply chain issues and inflation. Next slide. Um, as I had kind of alluded to earlier, um, we are rebounding positively. Um, however, we are still cautious on the sustainability of this recovery, how long this pent up demand will last um, and, and really with the uncertainty of new strains like Omicron um, and how that will impact and how fast it will spread, how deep it will spread, et cetera. Next slide. Moving on um, into program modifications being requested. In the city manager's office, their uh, request is to convert one operations assistant to one CCTV uh, Torrance Cable uh, supervisor, that would be a general fund cost of ten, about $10,000. The current position oversees public access function and, and cable um, and the, the corresponding staff. That includes production assistants, interns, and an administrative assistant. Over the years, um, this position has um, gained some increased responsibilities and as such, um, the cable division is requesting this. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not just an upgrade, conversion. Next slide. Um, in community services, a re the recommendation is to reinstate the administrative assistant. Um, there is still a net neutral impact to the general fund budget, um, as staff has identified further non-wage reductions, mainly um, in recurring savings that the department anticipates with um, implementing what they're calling a floating collection, so they won't ne uh, no longer need to purchase multiple copies of the same items for each branch, and additionally, the electronic and digital resources that will now be provided by the state portion. Next slide. In finance, the recommendation is to convert two intern positions into one administrative assistant, which is a saving um, about a savings of $7,000 um, uh, so this position plays an important role as mainly in workers' compensation is where they would be assigned uh, um, to file and then serve legal correspondence, prepare notices, respond to phone calls. Um, essentially, um, it, it would be to maintain um, consistency within the department as typically the interns tend to move on to other opportunities on a frequent basis. Next slide. Um, in fire, one of the two uh, recommendations is to convert one fire prevention specialist to a senior fire prevention specialist. 
Um, about four years ago, the final Cal Art Program 4 regulations were adopted to improve public and worker safety um, through enhanced oversight of refineries and strengthen emergency preparedness. Uh, Torrance Fire Department is the local agency responsible for providing this oversight to the Torrance Refining Company. Um, and so in order to meet the regulatory impact affecting the city, they're seeking to upgrade this position. And that's a cost of $1,700. Next slide. The second request uh, recommendation from fire is to delete one ad administrative assistant and to upgrade a senior administrative analyst to a policy and resources specialist, um, considering the, um, that the fire department has evolved um, considerably over the years um, with now being 72% uh, of the department's responses being related to rescue and medical emergencies. Um, in response to this growth, uh, senior admin analyst has carried increased levels of responsibility, um, including but not limited to budget preparation, including capital, management reports, complex response time and performance analyses, top studies, legislative tracking and grant application management. This um, is uh, a net zero uh, cost to the city. Um, there was um, a small savings, however, FIRE um, wishes to maintain and keep those savings in the budget as they evaluate other positions. Next slide. And lastly, in transit, a recommendation is to convert one human resources analyst to an HR senior management associate, which is a $31,000 uh, increase to the transit fund. Um, they're seeking to upgrade a vacant, um, the vacant HR analyst position uh, to more actively engage in the recruitment and selection process which is an increased scope of responsibility from the senior management associate role. Um, the department's operations um, will continue to expand with the regional transit center opening in 2022. And this will allow the transit services manager who was hired to oversee the daily operations of the RTC, RTC to focus on those functions um, and reduce the focus on recruitment efforts as that um, incumbent is currently doing right um, at the, so that's the last program modification. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Interim uh, uh, Deputy City Treasurer Christopher Ashi. Thank you, Ms. Poisson. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Ashcraft and committee members. Chris Ashi, Interim Deputy City Treasurer at the Finance Department. Uh, I'll be giving a brief presentation of the investment portfolio, which includes the first quarter analysis. Uh, next slide, please. These are the uh, discussion topics. I'll start by discussing the portfolio objectives for the city, performance to show the city's interest earned yield percentage, followed by compliance to show the city is in compliance with the California government code. And lastly, I'll touch on the interest rate market. Next slide. This slide shows the city's objectives in order of priority, uh, which is first safety, uh, in which the city invests funds in high quality government securities with a maximum maturity of five years. Uh, second, to ensure the city's funds are liquid, which means the city's funds are readily available uh, to be used to meet city's payment obligations and operating needs. And third, to invest idle funds to the fullest extent possible while continuing to meet the city's uh, cash flow needs. Next slide. This slide shows quarter over quarter performance in September. Uh, there are a few takeaways in this slide. The total amount of funds and investments did increase from September 2020 at 102.2 million to September 2021 at 113.9 million. However, the city yield decreased from September 2020 to September 2021, which was anticipated um, as interest rates remain low um, and the city is investing more funds in LAIF as LAIF is liquid and earning 0.20%. As you can also see, the days of maturity has dropped uh, from 1.2 years to one year, which is a direct result of moving more funds into LAIF. Uh, overall, the city is conservative and is investing in the short term uh, as the city has maximized putting funds into LAIF to maintain liquidity and flexibility during these times. Next slide, please. The city is in compliance according to the city's investment policy in regards to the percentage of, of each investment type allowed. Uh, you can see by the investment type, the percentages of the portfolio in the left column are less than the percentages allowed in the right column. Next slide. 
And the city is also in compliance with the California Government Code Section 53646, which requires the city to report its cash flows over the next six months, uh, showing, this, showing the city is able to meet its, meet its expenditures. Um, and you can see over the next six months, the city has a uh, projected cash balance of approximately 75.7 million. Next slide, please. This slide is a guiding tool to show you where the city yield is headed towards. Uh, the blue and gray curves are the one and two year constant maturing US treasury rates, which the city uses as a reference to show where the city yield is going to gravitate towards. And you can see both of these cur curves remained low. Uh, the orange curve is the city yield, where you can see it's slowly decreasing, but still earning higher than the LAFE yield in yellow. And the LAFE yield in yellow, you can also see, um, is, is uh, decreasing. Next slide, please. And regarding the market, uh, interest rates trended downward toward the first half of this calendar year in 2021. Uh, however, we, we did see fixed income interest rates started to increase from August 2021. Um, as the Fed hinted at possible rate hikes in 2023 or possibly earlier. And as a result, the market priced in the rate hikes and interest rates um, have, has uh, increased. However, the news did come out after uh, regarding the new COVID-19 strain Omicron, uh, which continues to create uncertainty in the market. And lastly, uh, due to the city's financial position, uh, interest income in the city's portfolio is projected to decrease through fiscal year end 2022, uh, since the city has less funds invested in government securities and more funds invested in late, uh, which the city remains uh, conservative. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, after I turn it over to Mr. Chaparian, uh, I'll pause to see if there's any questions related to investments. Thank you, Mr. Ashi. Chair, I'll take over. Uh, thank you, Ms. Poisson, uh, Finance Department, City Treasurer's Office, as well as all departments. Um, as you can see from the recap, uh, the goal for the city manager and finance department and all departments is to uh, rebuild reserves and stabilize the city's budget. And we'll do that uh, through awareness of all the uncertainty that faces the city. While we are seeing positive signs in the recovery, we also remain uh, uh, aware of, of the various uh, uncertainties that remain, such as the most recent uh, Omicron variant. 22, uh, 2021 was a re year of reopening with all the pent up demand, along with wide widespread vaccination rollouts, the booster shots, easing of restrictions and school reopenings. Uh, and what, while the positive uh, revenues are certainly welcome, there are several areas of concerns. As we mentioned, we, we provided you a path to fix our overtime shortage and not rely on overtime as a year end carryover as a balancing strategy. Um, significant rise in litigation costs, known and unknown which is additional 15.8 million in contributions. Uh, fleet service fund, our need to create a replenishment to rely on a stabilized funding structure um, and address the deficit. The need for liquidity uh, to improve the city's financial standing uh, on the state controllers list, as well as our uh, reliance on our liquidity uh, and as a mechanism to invest our uh, uh, less reliance on LAIF since LAIF earned so, so little. And then uh, as shared with our finance director, experiencing a significant turnover of staffing, both due to reco uh, retirements as well as employee departures. The need to remain an employer of choice. Uh, granted, we have been with our contract for our miscellaneous employee groups now for over two years. The fire uh, MOU will be expiring end of this fiscal year and police uh, contract is another year and a half, end of 23. Next slide, please. So as conclusion, uh, as I've said in the past, I'll say it again, uh, uncertainty is our new certainty. The high demand has created supply chain constraints. We hear that uh, many of our dealerships uh, are experiencing a low inventory due to the chip shortage. They hope to return to normal levels in 23. The new variants still cause some concern. And then several global economic factors that should be following the news. There's a lot of uncertainty about um, geopolitical pressure, stock market volatility, housing market slowdown, just to name a few. And here in Torrance, uh, constant awareness of litigation concerns and the exposure thereof. And then as the uh, state is looking at drought restrictions, they will have an impact on our utility users tax. Next slide, please. Um, we continue to be vigilant uh, in monitoring our financial situation. Lots of staff time and effort is focused on stabilizing our, our budget and ensuring the essential services remain uh, front and center. 
there are some positive uh, developments. Uh, as mentioned, if you drive around the town, you'll notice all the construction that's happening, including the Hanum Grocery Market, Hawthorne, the senior living facility that's permitted, Revian headquarters to be on California Avenue, polypeptide expansion, uh, biochem extension, just to name a few, as well as additional businesses that we continue to attract and, and the focus to retain the businesses that we have. Next slide, please. So uh, in, in recap, before I turn over to you for questions, what we're asking you is to accept and file the first quarter report, 2021-22 um, budget review report. Increase general fund operating revenue budget by 7.6 million. Increase the general fund operating expenditure budget by 7.6 and approve the program modifications as stated before you. And our goal is to bring the bu balanced budget next, uh, next June with the uh, community conversation continuing in regards to potential sales tax ballot measure and all the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead. With that, myself, uh, our interim uh, deputy treasurer, as well as our finance director and department heads are available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Chair. Any members? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Poisson, Mr. Daly, and Mr. Ashi. Um, and thank you, Ms. Poisson, also for meeting with us individually and, and taking that time because a lot of information. Um, I'll turn it over to anybody with questions uh, up here and on committee. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Mr. Griffith. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the very detailed and very voluminous uh, information provided to us. It's all very important. And granted, it is uh, a lot to digest. Um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Poisson, for the extra time and discussing this in de detail. Uh, separately prior to the meeting. A um, couple of comments or questions is the rescue plan money that's indicated is in this budget of $12 million. That's the last payment, is that correct, of our rescue money? That's correct. The second and last payment was expected to come in June 2022. And is there anything further that we are aware of down the road? For Not that I'm aware of. Um, we had applied for additional um, projects through FEMA and that's still under final review a year later. There is the, uh, Councilman, there is the federal infrastructure funding, but we're not aware of what the uh, Torrance portion of the allocation will be. Okay. Um, and then obviously the, to me, the, the overtime is kind of like the black hole of our uh, general fund. And um, we discussed that I'd like to see some more information how that overtime breaks out. Uh, it's really something that the council hasn't really had direct authority over. We, we allocate a, a budget amount for it, but then through uh, unfilled positions that are budgeted, you departments take money and, and, and sign uh, uh, overtime that's really not brought to council for approval. I'd like to see more detail, and maybe my uh, colleagues would agree that maybe we can see a more regular uh, report on overtime usage, even by month. Uh, to see where we're trending, what departments are really heavily dependent on over time, and what ways we can control that. Uh, because obviously, if we're going to be required to tighten our belts even further, uh, I think it's going to be really important to have a strong handle on the overtime. Uh, litigation, obviously, is an expense that uh, is significantly higher than we've experienced in the past. And unfortunately, it's something that uh, it's hard to budget for because those things change from time to time uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately I think we're in an unusual period of, of litigation and I think the general trends and maybe the um, city attorney might be able to touch on this is our general trends of litigation expense uh, over longer periods of time uh, uh, except for the exceptions that we're facing at the moment uh, I'm not sure how we can I think it's a, a universal problem that most entities are facing increased litigation costs but I'm just wondering if there's any things that we can do to help mitigate some of those litigation costs uh, and, and I don't mean this in any negative way but if, if we have some stronger uh, defenses on some of these situations is that a way that we can somehow uh, minimize some of the litigation expense uh, so I want to get creative and figuring out how we can reduce our litigation uh, expenses uh, through whatever means possible. So those are my comments and suggestions at the moment. 
Councilman, if I may, we, sure. we, we have an active risk management plan uh, through our risk manager, Jason Nishiyama, working through the city attorney's office, as well as the departments in uh, implementing mitigation measures, proactive mitigation measures, which will reduce our risk exposure uh, within the purview, obviously, of city operations. But we do continue to be volatile to external pressures. And we can uh, give you additional information in the future. Great. Regarding our efforts, thank you. Thank you. Committee Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Actually, uh, thank you, Committee Member and Councilman Griffith for some of the questions. Uh, I'll start backward from where he ended. Um, the litigation issues is, uh, is very challenging in our city. And some development area, I think I actually had two sessions with Ms. Bryson because I needed extra time to absorb the report to see if there's any way we could reduce our litigation costs in some areas, if this possible, that we can have the internal staffing available or or uh, able to, so that we have less dependency on outside counsel in some cases. Uh, it seems like we have a lot of uh, outside consultants. Uh, one question I want to ask is, it's just a reminder, Ms. Paisan, I think right in the beginning when you start out the presentation, not page number, so it's a, it's a title, Five-Year General Fund Financial History, probably your very first slide. I thought toward the end, and I just wrote this, by the end of fiscal year 2022, I believe, 21-22, you, I think you said something, we'll have $24 million. Is that, what does that $24 million, what is that $24 million? I just want to make sure I heard it correctly. That was in reference to our unassigned fund balance. So our unassigned fund balance can, it also includes our economic anomaly reserve. Okay. So, yeah. so since unassigned, that means we have a lot of freedom based on this projection of $24 million where we want to put it. There's a lot of flexibility. Correct. Whether Should we, we mm -hmm. want to put in the reserve or not. Correct. I think one of your slides, I'm going, I'm going by memory now, the 20% mm -hmm. rule of thumb, we would like to be in the 40-ish, 43 million. 43. I'm, I'm going by memory again. Yep. That we'd like to be in, to be in the, about the safe zone, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. So which means if the trend is consistent, because we're just coming out of pandemic, and we're, in, we're projecting 24 million, would it be incorrect to say that in two years, this is just simple math, 24 times two is 48 million, we would be getting to close to the green zone if we allocate all of the 24 million to reserve? That's a big if. Um, what I will say in response to that is that we've been able to build back up to that 24 million through I guess I could say extreme measures. We've held like about 150 vacancies. Yeah. Um, and in the previous year for fiscal 21, most in our, um, in our first quarter budget report, we note that $32 million of one-time revenue sources were used last year that helped fund that, including the ARPA funds of 12 million. Um, if you recall, we closed some capital projects that was 4 million we um, had transferred about $5 million from transit for their share of the regional transit center land. Um, and then there was 1.8 million in CARES Act and the other nine and a half million one time from the lease revenue bond issuance. So we can't expect those one times to recur going forward. And then again, we got that 12 million this year that we won't be seeing in the following years. So we have done, um, refreshed our 10-year forecast. Um, it is in one of these slides. Uh, let me try and flip back to it. Right before program modification. We'll have page numbers next time. So. <laughs> 42. It does have, I think, at least mine does. Slide 42, if you have it on yours. Not in the, not in the I'm sorry. La we'll landscape time. slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so right after total employer contribution, right after PERS and before program modification. <laughs> so yeah. we 
have refreshed, as, as you had mentioned. Um, there aren't any one time. There we go. Going forward, what we can expect in revenues and expenses going forward, um, if we can, if we address overtime litigation um, and the fleet replacement fund, we're still anticipated to be at a deficit. If the police and fire reductions are implemented, at that point, then we will have uh, the ability, as you see on the very, almost the second to last line, we, we will have the ability to, to um, add to our unassigned fund balance in these areas, uh, these years, I'm sorry, starting in fiscal 25. That's when we can start. Okay. Uh, thank you for, act my, my question was actually much more simpler. <laughs> it, it was very, yeah, yeah, I, I understand if we do nothing that. Nothing else. Right. We'll have the the re re reserve balance. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was getting at. I, no. I, I understand. I don't want to. I don't want to be overly optimistic. And I think financial reports good to be cautiously optimistic. And I, I realize that. I was just asking a simple question. It was, you know, you, you, you did a simple ton. You got twenty four million dollars this year. There's potentially forty eight million dollars next year. Uh, at least in that ballpark. Or if you say we don't do as well. You can say, well, may, maybe next year, let's see, we may get half of that. Let's say maybe 10 million. It may take three years to build up the reserve to, to, to 40 If we're putting no other categories, assuming we have the yeah. same projections right. of uh, the revenue, right. then that, that, that's a fair statement that sure. we can rebuild. Unless finance wants to chime in. Go ahead. I'll try to add a little light on this one. So on this slide, uh, if we pay attention to, for reference, in like say FY25, because before that very little, it would be planned in terms of adding to that unassigned fund balance. But for reference in FY25, the economic anomaly reserve contribution, 3.5, that would be an increase to the unassigned fund balance because the reserves are part of that total. The litigation reserve contribution, 1.5, same. So that's 5 million. And then if police and fire were to implement their cuts, an additional 1.2 could be. So we're looking at 6.2 million in additional uh, unassigned fund balance uh, happening in that year. Years prior, it's even less. So no, we would not continue on that trajectory of going from 24 to 48, namely because of those one-time revenues that we experienced in 21 and in 22. And we've moved a lot of funds, Councilman, to build that 24 million. Say that, that again? We moved s several funding categories, as <coughs> mentioned, on a one-time basis to rebuild that reserve from the uh, unrestricted 600,000 to the 24 as a buffer, but we can't rely on those single one-time sources moving forward. Uh, sure, sure. I understand. I, 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 what I was trying to do is clarify. I saw the 24 million unassigned, and unassigned to me means unassigned to me means potentially reserve. That's all I was doing. I wasn't trying to read too much into it, and if there's something else to help me clarify, maybe the next quarter review. I guess make make it so that it's C spot run. I can't miss it. I, I'm just I was just doing that. And the one time ones, I know we can't bank on one time fund. That I understand that as well. Um, I understand the OT. I think that uh, Councilman Griffith did a good uh, description on that. This is a. Uh, I know a lot of times, you know, at industry practices, it's often you got to find that good balance, right? Because uh, do some overtime is actually good because you don't have to hire extra staff, which comes with all the benefits and all the pension that goes along with it. But you just got to ha have that right balance and and put the right budget in there. I think the key, key issue is if you don't know what the anticipated overtime is and you're trying to balance it by under hire, that's kind of a risky uh, way to balance your budget by under hire. Because we will really want the right size staff to do the job. Uh, Councilman, to your point, we have a certain overtime built into the budget just from normal operating conditions. However, the recent fluctuations in reliance of vacancies as a balancing tool uh, has created challenges w with additional strain on the existing employees. At, at some point, uh, going into the 22 23 fiscal budget, we'll need to right size the operations and, and those are the back to the, the pending police and fire reductions because that'll fundamentally change our uh, bottom bottom line but uh, yes we, we we try to reflect an accurate 
uh, assumption of uh, built-in OT versus the fluctuation, which is really shifting the dollars from uh, potential filled positions to vacancies. Uh, as you stated, so in some instances it helps us in saving on overhead, but it does place an additional burden on the organization. And the, the vacancy situation we've been having and using, I'll call it the understaffing. I don't know if that's the best term, but at least it's easy to understand by understaffing. We've actually been using that understaff for more than a few years. Would that be accurate? We typically have a, uh, a rolling vacancy pool. By the time somebody declares their intention to retire or leave the agency, there's a recruitment period. And we've been carrying anywhere from 80 to 100 positions, okay. just an organization of our size. But we've, we've doubled that intentionally, uh, at least in the last two years, in a way to uh, avoid, uh, to create revenue uh, and to avoid any drastic impacts. Sure. And thank you very much. Sure. And I think I, sh in my earlier discussion with Ms. Poisson, um, going in the future, I know, you know it's hard to predict. You know, no one knows the crystal ball how much we're going to come back. Uh, some certain areas that I'm, I'm interested in is each department. Department lead really uh, do some kind of a, I'll call it bottoms up review, uh, do some lean practices, lean lean principles to see if there's any area that we could lean out to get the right size staffing, uh, whatever that may be. I, you know I can't predict it, but at least I'm just looking for more uh, more areas. Uh, well, we could do that regularly, Councilman. And as you probably saw in the beginning slides, we've been uh, trimming and leaning the last. Uh, uh, several budget cycles, uh, knowing that there's so much uncertainty with since the post-pandemic, at some point we'll, we'll have to come to terms with what level of service we're going to be able to provide going ahead. Right. But as a business practice, yes, you know, the right. statement about being consciously aware of our operational needs and, and making sure that we've been doing that since 08. Every time we had a vacancy, we paused and asked, asked ourselves, is this the best way of doing business? Uh, through all the reorganizations that you've probably seen, uh, Th that's almost part of part and true and parcel to our operations and making sure we provide the best service with the, the appropriate amount of staffing. And that's credit to all the departments and, and the staff working hard to provide those services. Great. And I, I just have one last question um, that probably goes to Mr. Ashu. I think last time he reported on this, you, you probably heard me ask on the dais about our flexibility and our investment. It just seems like I know we have to invest based on our investment policy. Uh, at the next available opportunity to revisit a policy, I would just ask whatever the investment policy group or committee is to see if uh, we're willing to uh, open up a little bit uh, so that we can have the opportunity to gain better returns than the, the current one. That whatever may be wise. That, that's all I asked. I don't know what the smart thing is, because I just felt like you know, we're so handcuffed. We, we do have a very conservative fiscal policy, and I'll turn it to Mr. Ashi. Uh, just historically, uh, because of our reliance on liquidity through LAIF, LAIF has a set uh, threshold. We did create the pension trust, uh, which allows us greater investment return, gr granted higher volatility. But should council choose, we could uh, conduct a study of other municipal agencies and, and bring back an item on the thresholds of what other agencies are established, th uh, what their policy what the benchmarks are. Oh, sure. And I'll turn it to Mr. Osh. Yeah, that answer. is possible. That would be great, maybe, you know, check with other agencies, responsibility. I, I just felt like, you know, every month I see it. Yeah, I just want to, yeah, I just want to state, so uh, we do follow the local agency investment guidelines, and it's a state investment policy. So uh, California Government Code 53601, it states all the investments that local agencies are allowed to invest. And there's no equities, no stocks, no risky investments there. That, I'm looking at the list right now, and it mirrors what we have already in our investment policy, which is why we kind of, you know, we have to adhere to that policy. So um, it, it is there. It's a state investment policy, so all of the local agencies have to adhere to that. Got it. I understand. That, that's all I have. Thank you very much. But, but we can review to ensure if, if there's any other models outside of the government code that can be within our purview. Yeah. Thank you. Report back. Thank you. I just have one quick question. On the uh, new EMS transfer 
program that we have. Money to start that up this past year was loaned to uh, the EMS program. Do we have a budget item that shows the payback on that? And how, how is that going? It's included in our FY23 budget to return that back to the capital fund that we borrowed from. Starting in the in 23? Fiscal 23. Okay, correct. thank you. And it is anticipated uh, based on our uh, results from April to now that we will meet our revenue expectation. Great, thank you. Are we committee members? No more questions? Thank you. What? Not here. Mr. Shaparian, do we have the public? Uh, I, I can check with the call center if we have any other, any other callers on the line. Thank you, Councilman. No callers at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. We have no callers at this time. Okay, so before us, we have two recommendations. The first being a uh, recommendation of the finance director that we accept and file the first quarter 2021 22 budget review report and recommend to City Council to accept and file this first quarter. Can I have a motion? With the recommended budget modifications, Council. Oh, and we can do it in policy. one, we can do it in one vote? No, you can do one on one, that's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's go one Let's by one. Let's take the first one. Okay, okay count, Council Member, is there a motion? Oh, I thought, um, so the, it's motion for just the accept Correct. report? Correct, for right now. I'll move to accept it and file a report. I will second that. Okay, the roll call, Chair Ashcraft? Yes. Councilman Chen? Yes. Councilman Griffiths? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Thank you. Okay, second recommendation is a uh, recommendation that the Finance and Governmental Operations uh, Committee approve the increase in general fund operating revenue budget by 7,600. No, seven million six hundred thousand dollars, and this is a one-time. That's not stated here, but I think we need to put that in that it's a one-time increase. Noted. We're going each item individually. You could take it as a whole if you like. We'll take the whole thing as a whole. Then the increase in yeah. Yeah, I'll move to uh, uh, concur with all items one through seven uh, on the uh, recommendations on six B. I second. Roll call, Chair Ashcraft? Yes. Councilman Chen? Yes. Councilman Griffith? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, at this time, I'll ask my colleagues for a motion to adjourn. I'm, I move to adjourn the Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting. I'll second that. I'll take roll call, Chair Ashcraft? Yes. Councilman Chen? Yes. Councilman Griffiths? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Members. Thank you, team.